Well, good evening. I'm glad that you were able to join us again. We're, we're happy that you keep enduring with us and, and logging in. We're, we're glad to have people that, that tune in, and we really appreciate you when you do tune in, that you make a comment that, that lets us know that you're there, and, and we get some feedback from you, and we appreciate that. That's always encouraging for us to know that, that our efforts are not in vain, uh, but, but we're here for one purpose in the middle of the week, to kind of stop and and to refocus our attention upon God. And, and so we're, we're glad that you're able to join us. Um, the, the platform is a little empty uh, this week because uh, we've, we've got some Walt's on vacation. So Walt and Phyllis are gone and, and traveling for some time away. And, and then, then we had uh, several guitar players on Sunday, but, but it just worked out that they weren't able to make it today. But uh, we're looking forward to spending some time with you and, and seeking God. So let's just begin by bowing our heads and, and going to God in prayer. Father, we give you thanks that we have this privilege of coming and, and uh, in the middle of the week, stopping and, and giving our, our attention, our focus to you. We just pray that everything that we do and everything we say, we bring honor and glory to your name. And, and we just ask that you'd guide us and direct us and, and that you might span the distance that we have with our congregation, that you'd... you'd continue to encourage them and and remind them that they're not alone. Father, we love you and we thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. In, in your name we ask these things. Amen. So this is my favorite hymn, I think. Um, most of you will know this and I encourage you to, to sing and lift praises to God with us. Um, it's called How Great Thou Art. And I know you know it, so sing along with us tonight. Sings my 
just going to continue to lift praises and sing praises to his name because he's so worthy. He deserves all of our praise, our very best praise we can give him, whether it's in the sanctuary, in our homes, in the store. We should always be lifting up our voices and our hearts to Jesus. I sing praises to your to your name, oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, oh Lord, praises to your name.
we want to go to prayer at this time, and, and we want to continue to pray that, that we would find a cure for this virus, and we want to also lift up the Wellman family with uh, Beverly's funeral service on Friday at 3, and, and then we want to continue to pray for our church. Um, the, the building's been closed for several weeks now, but the church hasn't been closed, and there's been lots of ministry that's been going on. Some of you have been calling um, and pr- appreciate that. Uh, that's that's part of the church being in action, the church church moving forward. Um, but we are also looking forward to when we gather together, regather here, when the buildings opened up again. Uh, looking for June the 14th as a as the date to to do that. And we need some volunteers to help us uh, as we going to need to sanitize and clean after the service and. Uh, we also want to, and we already mentioned that Walt was gone. We want to want to pray for he and Phyllis and and Nancy Walker's at home. We continue to pray for her and and Leanne Steen also is, is in a rehab, Harbor Trails rehab. So so let's go to prayer at this time. Father God, we give you thanks for how you look out for us and and how you watch for us and. And the, the many times that, that you've led us and spoken to us and directed us when, and protected us when we, even when we were unaware. And we thank you for, for this opportunity we have to gather here in the middle of the week and, and to stop and, and give our attention to you. We thank you that, that we can sing praises to your name. We thank you that we can go to the God who holds this universe in his hands and we can bring our petitions and our requests to you, knowing that you will not just hear them, but knowing that you can respond, knowing that you can bring about change and bring about the healing that we need. And so, Father, we pray that you would do just that. We pray for, for our nation, for our leaders. We pray for the doctors, the, the scientists that are working on this cure. We pray that you'd give them wisdom. We pray that you'd help them to, to do what they can't figure out on their own, that, that, that you are the, the great physician. You're the one who, who has all knowledge and all understanding. And so, Father, we just pray that you'd help. We pray for our, our leaders in, in the churches as well. We, we think of Hernando Church. We pray that you'd, you'd help us as leaders to know when to reconvene, when the right timing for, uh, for what we do and, and regathering again and, and for the ministries that, that continue to go on. We pray that you'd help us, help us to have wisdom, help us to have our eyes open to see the opportunities where we can continue to serve, where we can continue to minister um, in your name and and uh, praise you and glorify you and 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 the words that we share with our neighbors and the way that we live our life and and our family members father we know that so many have family members that that aren't right with you and we just pray that that you would go span the miles and that you would bring conviction where conviction needs to be brought and we pray for encouragement we pray for a witness we pray that that in the community where some of our family members live that that there'd somehow be a witness that would rise up, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, somebody that would, would continue to encourage them, point them to you. God, and I pray that you'd use us in that same way, that we would be your witnesses. Help us to be your hands and your feet. Help us to, to be a, a bright, shining light in a dark world. And Father, we pray that you'd continue to be with the rest of this service, everything that we do and everything we say. For your honor, for your glory, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good evening. Tonight we'll be reading from the book of James, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, then he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, 
and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Thank you for your word. We thank you for the way that you communicate to us even today. Uh, we pray that we would not just be hearers of your word, but help us to put it into practice. We want to be doers of your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I thank David for reading the scripture today. I, he's been a blessing. Um, I know that it's, it's kind of a challenge for him and his job to get, to get here and, and to help out, but he's, he's been a blessing um, at why we've been shut down and in particular uh, needing all, all hands on deck, everybody that can help us out that we can get. So I appreciate David and stepping up and, and playing and, and reading the scripture. I'm sure that I'm not the only one that, is, that has said things that later I regretted. You know, those words come out of your mouth and you think, oh, if I could just pull them back. Um, that's, if I had, you know, a $10 bill for every time I've said something that I, that I could, you know, wish I could pull back, I'd, I'd have a lot of money. Um, but I was, I've got uh, police officers, law enforcement um, people in my family. And, and I, I ran across a list of things that you should not say to the police officer. And, and sort of in keeping context with Stephanie and her, her love for watching live PD, but apparently she's not the only one out there that enjoys watching live PD. But uh, things that you should not say to a police officer. Uh, number one, sorry, officer, I didn't realize my radar detector wasn't plugged in. You, you probably shouldn't say that. Um, or, hey, you must have been doing about 125 miles an hour to catch up with me. Good job. Or, or another thing you, sh you shouldn't say to the police officer is, oh, you're not going to check my trunk, are you? Um, and, th and then the last thing you probably shouldn't say to the police officer is, wow, that's great. Uh, the officer who stopped me about 10 miles back, he only gave me a warning also. Things you probably shouldn't say to the police officer. Um, and, but all of us have said things that, that later we regretted and we wish we wouldn't have said. Um, you know, if we could just kind of hit the rewind button and, and get those words back, it seems like our life would be a lot easier. But, you know, sometimes those words come out and, and you can see as they sink right between the eyes of the person that you're speaking with. And, and you know, you know, you know that you, you, you shouldn't have said it. Um, you know, this futility that comes after, afterwards, you know, when those words slip out of your mouth and, and, uh, and you can see what you've inflicted, the damage that has been done. Um, you know, even when you say, I, I, I didn't mean it that way, or, or even when you say, I'm sorry, I, um, you, you know the hurt's already happened. You, you know that it's already taken place. Um, some of our greatest regrets, I think, come around the words that we use. But also some of our greatest joys come around the words that we use, you know, whether it's, um, you know, maybe some of you remember when, when uh, you got down on one knee, maybe, and you said, will you marry me? Uh, and you saw what joy those words brought or, or it's a boy or it's a girl or, or I'm pregnant or, or I'm moving out of the house. You know, sometimes those words that you say bring great joy to those that you hear that, that hear. Um, those of you who are parents know sometimes that, that joy that comes when, when you hear those words, I'm, I'm going to move out on my own. All right. You know, um, words are powerful. They're, they're powerfully uh, harmful at times, but they can also be powerfully helpful and, and good. Um, and here James reminds us over and over again. Uh, in this, this little short book, I said it only takes about 11 minutes to read. 
Uh, some, somebody came back to me and said, it takes me a lot longer than 11 minutes. Come on, pastor. Um, well, if, if you're reading um, and you're reading through the book of James, it's, it's not very long. And, and you, have to, you have to remember that when Paul wrote his letter to Ephesus or wrote the letter to the church at Corinth or, or when James writes his letter to those churches, that, that they would have read the letter in its entirety, you know, from the beginning to the end. That's how they would have read that letter. And so you would, you would be sitting there listening to the messages that are coming out of this letter. And if you sat there and, and read from the beginning to the end of James's letter, you would be repeated over and over again about how we need to be careful with our mouth, how we need to be careful with our tongue. And then over and over again, James tells us, you've got to be doing, you've got to be doing. There's things that faith is a doing faith. It's an active faith. It's not just a sit on the couch faith. And, and James tells us part of this doing, part of this faith that is doing is controlling our mouth. And in verse 1, uh, we see that, that I am going to be held accountable for the words that I use when I preach, when I teach. I'm going to be held accountable for those words. And so one of the things that I'm trying to, I try to be careful with is I try to pray about my sermon, about my teaching when I'm, when I'm preaching. I, w- I want to do it in a way that's faithful to God and faithful to God's words. Now, I know that I'm not infallible. I know that sometimes uh, the things that I've said, I've not said very well. I've not said very clearly. Uh, I know that that happens from time to time, but, but I really try to pray because I recognize that, that I'm going to be held accountable for, for every word that I speak. And that goes not just for me, but also the Sunday school teachers. It goes for the leaders, for really all of us will we'll give an account for the words that we use. Verses two through four, um, this issue of mouth control uh, seems, to, seems to be an issue for many of us. Um, not just pastor, not just Uncle Harry, but uh, in verse three, James uses the analogy of how a big horse is controlled by a small bit. Uh, how this small bit is able to to control the horse in the direction that he goes. Um, and in verse 4, a big ship is controlled by a relatively small rudder. Um, you know, I I know that it's it's amazing to see, you know, some of these big animals and, and how they're controlled by, by, by a word, by a signal. Um, in verse, verse 5, James says the tongue is small, but it really sets the course for our life. And, and I was thinking about that a little bit. I remember my freshman uh, English teacher, Mrs. Kinney, and she was an older teacher, and a lot of the, a lot of the students didn't like her. Uh, but in our high school, we had kind of an older section of our high school building, and, and it was on the third floor, I think, was, was our class. And so I had to go up on the third floor, and, and Mrs. Kinney, I was, I was never you know, a top student in English and grammar and that sort of thing. So um, it was a challenge for me. English was a challenge for me. So Mrs. Kinney was one of those older teachers that was pretty stern and pretty strict. And yet I remember the words that she spoke to me. She said, uh, Andy, I think you have some good things to say. When I, when I read your writing, uh, I think you have some good things to say, but you're going to need to get a good secretary along the way, if, if you're going to be successful in life. And, and I remember those words because I took them as a compliment. Um, in spite of my poor grades I might have been getting in class, I took them as a compliment that, that, um, that there was still hope for me. And, and I think, you know, when you look back and you think about some of the teachers in your life or some of the mentors maybe you had in your life or maybe even a pastor that has spoken words to you, it, it's in, in, incredible how valuable those words are and how they shape you and direct you and guide you, how they encourage you. Uh, because we certainly can think back at, at the times we've been, we've been broken, when we've been, when we've been hurt by, by words that, that were harmful. Our words and our tongue determine a large part of, of how we live and, and the way that we live. Uh, I don't know if you, when you see a beware of dog sign, if, if that gets your attention. As a pastor, you know, one of the things that, that I try to do is to go follow up on, on, on people, maybe who are visitors to the church. Um, sometimes I'll try to write them a note or, you know, connection in some way, shape, or form with them. Well, I remember in Wichita, we had a grandmother who was bringing her granddaughter to church, and she was pretty regular about bringing her granddaughter to church, but she was moving out of town and, and then was concerned that, 
what's going to happen to my granddaughter? And I told her, I said, you know, I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll make sure that we make connection with her and see if we can't um, give her a ride on the church van. And so grandmother was, was she was pretty happy about that. And, and so I, I follow the address, go to this home, and I see a fenced-in yard, and, and I notice there's a big pit bull out in this yard. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, how am I going to get to that front door and knock on the door? I don't have the phone number of these, of these people. I don't know how I'm going to get in there. And, and, of course, the dog sees me and begins barking and showing this teeth. And, and I see the beware of dog sign. And so, I, so I'm talking to the dog and trying to calm the dog down. I, I stick my hand out a little bit. And, and uh, I don't know, I think I had some, some candy or something that I was going to bring the, the little girl and the I think the dog smelled some of that candy and stopped barking at me. And so I kept talking in, in uh, kind of soothing tones. And uh, the dog seemed to kind of stop being mean and I almost started wagging his, his tail. And so I walked into the, the, the gate and started my way on up the front door very cautiously, very carefully, watching this dog all the way. And, and I knocked on the door and, and, and uh, this, this girl's dad... Um, comes, he's a big guy. He comes to the door and, and pretty gruff. And he said, how'd you get in here? And I said, uh, I just walked through the gate. <laughs> he said, what's this blankety blank dog doing anyway? And this dog's supposed to be protecting him. And so he was all upset. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of felt bad. I might've got the dog in trouble, but, but as I related who I was and the pastor and knew the, his, his mom and, uh, his mother-in-law actually, and, and uh, he, he wasn't so upset with me, but he was more upset with the dog. But uh, you, you see those beware of dog signs. And then at least for me, my eyes start jutting around. I'm starting to look. I, I'm expecting the dog to come after me at any time. Uh, James is kind of telling us we need to be aware of our mouth. We need to be aware of our tongue. And it ought to put us on guard. We ought to be aware, be watching around the corner. Where this, where's this dog going to come after me? Where's my tongue going to trip me up? Where's it going to get out of line? Verse 6, James says, consider the evil of the world. Wars have been started by words. Divorce has be occurred because of words. Suicide's been initiated because of words. You can see the harm that words do, for sure. Um, but this is nothing, none of this is new. Uh, some of you are already w aware. You've, you, you know firsthand the harm that, that words can bring. Uh, some of you say, I, I don't need a Bible verse because I'm a walking illustration. I, I, I can tell you chapter and verse, I can tell you places where I've hurt people, how I've broken relationships with my tongue, with, with the words that I've used. So the, the problem that we have is, is not a lack of awareness. The problem is, is not a lack of information here because, because we can see the damage that comes with our tongue. And, and what we need, though, is some spiritual eyes. What we need is some spiritual awareness to, to understand the power of our tongue, and, and James is trying to, trying to drive this point home to us. So uh, it doesn't do us any good to make excuses. We've got to start by taking the responsibility. And, and I've heard all the excuses. I've made some of the excuses myself, and you probably have heard them as well. You know, when you say something hurtful, something harmful, and you say, well, I, I didn't really mean it, the damage has already been done, right? Or, or you, you get upset and you say some some harsh words to a spouse and you say well i'm just really tired i didn't sleep very good last night you know that doesn't fix the problem does it um i was i, I drank a little bit too much i i remember uh, an alcoholic and and he was in the midst of destroying his family and and the and the the excuse that he kept making was i i just had too much to drink that i didn't really mean those words but that never fixed the problem it never solved the, the, the broken relationship that he was, that he was causing. I've, I've seen it in churches where people say, well, I just speak the truth, as if that's, if that's an okay response for the harm that they do. I just speak the truth. I'm just being honest. Or, you know, like the umpire, I just call it as I see it. You know, I'm, I'm just telling it as I see it. Um, or I inherited my temper from my dad. Or, um, you know, I just, that's the way my family talked. Those excuses don't really solve our problem. It's not addressing the problem that James wants to address here. 
And, and our tongues can do damage, and James wants to remind us of this. Uh, in verse 7, see how all kinds of animals are tamed by um, you know, lions and elephants and dolphins and whales. We can tame them, but how, how difficult it is for us to tame our tongue. But yet it is possible for us to tame our tongue. And, and that's the good news that I have. The application, the solution here is that it is possible that we can control our mouth, that we can control our tongue. And, and I know when we, when we look at scriptures, we see not just in James, but we see throughout the Bible some directions on how we are to control our tongue, how we're to tame our tongue. In Matthew, we're reminded, you know, Jesus said, but I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. We have to take responsibility for, for all the words that we speak, even the careless words that just slip out of our mouth without us thinking, without us, without us being cognizant of, of them. Well, the first thing we need to do is take responsibility and admit that we're the ones. We can't blame somebody else. We can't, we can't make the excuse. We've got to take responsibility. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Um, but, but secondly, we need to test what we say. And, and I want you to look at this verse in Ephesians 4, 29. Paul's pretty clear here. He says, do not let any, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Wow. Those are pretty powerful, aren't they? The words that we speak, we don't want any unwholesome talk come out. And so we can, we can, we can call it, I'm just speaking the truth. I'm just being honest. I'm just calling it as I see it. But whether we debate whether that's unwholesome or not, here's what's pretty clear. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that they may benefit those who listen. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Well, Proverbs twelve eighteen, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. Reckless words come, come out from the fool, uh, but the wise, their, their tongue brings out healing. As somebody observed that the reason the dog has so many friends is because he wags his tail more than he wags his tongue. Um, I, I like dogs, so, so I like using dogs for an illustration. But um, how often are we talking when we should, when we should be looking for ways to, to um, encourage and, and to heal and to build others up? Proverbs 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. So we be on guard. Watch, you know, beware of the, the dog, right? Beware of our tongue. Be on guard. Guard your mouth. The disciples of Jesus, we need to take this, these words of Jesus in Matthew 12 serious. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. And I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall, have, they shall give an account of on the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. How powerful, how powerful are our words according to Jesus? This is not, these are not my words. According to Jesus, how powerful are words? Our words are what's going to justify us. Our words are what's going to condemn us. We need to be on guard with our mouth, with our tongue, with the words that we use. Um, only, only with the help of a gracious, merciful God can we control our tongue, can we tame our tongue. It's only with the help of the Holy Spirit. It's only with the help of, of the fire of God that purifies us from the inside out can we see change take place with the use of our tongue and with the use of our words. You know, James has given us a warning here. Our, our tongue can do great damage. It made me think of um, the old Smokey the Bear ads, you know, only you can prevent forest fires. You know, you think these little little sparks can set a whole forest on fire well well james is reminding us of that same thing our our tongue can be very damaging 
but he's also, it's also a reminder to us that, that it's only God, it's only through his Holy Spirit, it's only through the grace of God can, can we tame our tongue and we keep it in check and in control. And instead of causing damage and inflicting harm upon people, we can, we can build others up, we can do good. My prayer is that the Hernando Church would be a church not filled with gossip and hurtful words and cutting others down and insulting others. My prayer for the Hernando Church is that, that we would use our tongues to build others up, to encourage one another, um, to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's my prayer. And, and I think Crystal and David, they're going to come and lead us in a, in a closing song. And I pray that you would make this song your prayer, Refiner's Fire. Choose to be. 